Good afternoon, everyone. So we were waiting for a microphone, uh, for a second microphone, but we're, we're just going to crack on. Welcome to my presentation uh, titled Performing On Demand and uh, Under Pressure. Uh, so my name's Phil Webley. Uh, I'm going to start off just uh, introducing myself for those of you that don't know me. Uh, so I, I became a Flight One instructor around about this time last year. Uh, and last year I, I delivered canopy courses uh, all around the UK on, on the sports side. Uh, just before Christmas, I, I got brought onto the, the military side of, of Flight One, which took a little bit of a extra kind of like training and, and um, selection process. I've got about 4,000 skydives, uh, some of the ratings I hold uh, AFF instructor and uh, tandem instructor. Uh, the coach ratings I, um, I, I'm most active in are, are free flying and tracking uh, coach ratings. And, um, uh, and also I'm an um, IBA rated uh, tunnel coach. Um, I also do some, some FS coaching, but that, that tends to be more, more on the military side. Uh, I compete uh, as regularly as possible uh, in canopy piloting and, and VFS. Uh, back in 2019, I was fortunate enough to be part of the, the UK um, head-up record. Um, so I'm, I'm also drawing on some of this presentation uh, on my, my time 20 years uh, in, in the military. And part of that, I'm, I was uh, part of the Red Devils uh, display team uh, for about three years. Uh, also, be, I'll be drawing on, on my um, sort of experiences. Uh, I've, I've been kind of playing music all my life. I uh, didn't actually pick up the guitar till, till I was an adult, but I've played some sort of instrument uh, since I was quite young. Uh, so, so recently, that kind of turned into the, the, the wing in it skydiving band, which I was v uh, very fortunate to be brought um, part of, and it's especially more special the, the fact that um, it, we're all active skydivers. So uh, some, some factors that make skydiving a high pressure environment. So in, in all, all my different experiences, I, 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 I would put the, the learning environment that skydive in or trying to learn in, in that environment is one of the mo more high pressure environments that, that I've kind of experienced. And I try to sort of sympathize with that whenever I've got like AFF um, students, etc. So in skydiving, some performance is always mandatory. Okay, what once once you've sort of exited the plane, you have to do at least a little bit to kind of make it through that skydive. Um, <coughs> goes without saying, uh, I'm sure everyone is aware that there is a risk of injury but we're, um, to, to skydiving, uh, which can put the pressure on. Uh, you can feel self-conscious, especially when you're jumping with others, whether it's part of a load organized group or you're jumping with a coach um, or, or or your instructor. You can you can kind of like feel that performance anxiety. Maybe you've got high expectations of yourself, uh, or maybe you're concerned of, of like the the amount of money you're spending on it. So this is by no means an, uh, an exhaustive list, um, but yeah, I think that sometimes it's uh, it's easy to forget that you know, skydiving is a, is a high pressure kind of environment. Um, so so what what motivated me to to, to make this lecture? So I was approached to kind of um, um, to do a lecture for for the AGM. Um, and so it's kind of drawing on um, a lecture that I gave on my Flight One Instructor course. So I'm kind of like drawing some of that on. And uh, I've, I have wrote an article um, earlier in the year as well. So I'm kind of drawing on that. And that was never meant to be an article. That was kind of taken from that original presentation. Um, and, and basically, um, it's kind of like to answer some of the, the more like, like bigger picture questions. I kind of constantly get asked, like, how long does it learn take to, to, to learn to swoop? Do I need to back fly before I can start sit flying? Am I ready for whatever canopy? How long until I can fly head down? They're all, all the questions I kind of get. What height did you start that turn? And I saw this post on Instagram, how, how can I do it? Okay, and, and generally I've, um, with this, I want to talk about how, how to kind of like maximize uh, progression in, in coaching, kind of de dealing with pressure. So some things that won't be covered, um, th there's not any canopy training in this. So sorry to dis disappoint you, there's not any like flight one kind of stuff. So th this isn't really the environment to kind of um, to cover that where some of you may not be jumping until April and I've got no idea once you go away whether you've misunderstood anything I've said. So the time to do canopy training is on a DZ, um, on a course. So the perfect height of starting at 270 won't be covered on this uh, lecture. And I don't really want to get down the rabbit hole of dissecting British skydiving's new CT progression as well. Okay. So get going into it, what, what does it take to, to master a, a skill and, and, and how much does that take? 
And a lot of studies have shown that um, it, it about 10,000 hours um, spent uh, like practicing a skill is what, what will kind of ca cause you to master it. Uh, but also other, other factors like how frequently you practice. Volume of practice is how, how much you practice. For instance, if you practice two hours a day instead of one hour a day, uh, et cetera. And it must be purposeful practice. Now, there's a, there's a section a little bit later on, on on that. For now, all I'll say is purposeful practice is where you're deliberately trying to get better and, and improve. Um, so, so when I first kind of gave a variation of this lecture, it was to quite accomplished skydivers, and not just accomplished in skydiving, but in other fields. And 10,000 hours was quite I intimidating, and it, it, there was like a bit of a question, like, like what, what, what was the point? So, th remember that's like, like pure, pure mastery, okay? And people can excel without kind of having 10,000 hours um, at, at a skill. So when I looked into it a little bit further, to be proficient of a skill, okay, a bit more manageable, it's about 20 hours. Okay, the initial progress um, is, is quicker and, and more noticeable in those early stages, and you enter the, the enjoyable stage. Okay, so um, a, a, lot of, um, a lot of things that are uh, enjoyable uh, require a bit of skill, but unfortunately that process to get, get to that stage tends not to be enjoyable at times. So visually, what, what that looks like, um, one to, compared to 20 hours, and what I've done is I've, I've kind of put stroke jumps there. Um, now, when you sort of um, kind of add it up to, to try and think like how you could spend 10,000 hours either under canopy or in free fall, it's, I, I hope like one day I'll be proven wrong, but at the moment, um, uh, th th that doesn't seem, seem possible in someone's lifetime. So maybe we need to reframe our kind of um, uh, the, the way we think about it and, and in terms of like repetition so the easy way for us is how many jumps so one hour or jump compared to 20 hours or, or jumps and what that looks like okay so that's obviously 20 times that of an amateur to become proficient um so what, what i call like the sort of expertise level is around about a thousand hours at, at skill um or, or a thousand jumps and how, how that can sort of be considered in skydiving so obviously AFF level one you've done one jump um, generally an amateur a license it, it, there's, there's a certain degree of proficiency there where at least you're kind of trusted to kind of look after yourself a little bit more okay but then when um, sort of an AFF instructor level that's kind of the expertise area not necessarily mastery of, of the skill, but certainly expertise enough to, um, to kind of be, be supervising the, the, the um, uh, younger jumpers. So that's, that's 50 times that of um, what's considered pr proficiency. And then when we compare that to the 10,000 of, of mastery, or uh, 10,000 hours or, or jumps mastery, you can see how, um, like visually, how, how, how long it takes to kind of really, really master a skill. Um, so an, an another way to think about the learning process, a really popular way to think about it, is um, so I initially you, you're um, you unconscious incompetence where you, you ne don't necessarily realise where you're going wrong. And uh, either yourself or with the help of a coach who's kind of like pointed out to you um, maybe where you're going wrong. The next stage is a bit more frustrating because you're now aware of what you're doing wrong. Okay, but you haven't necessarily got round to kind of putting it um, put it right and fixing it. So that can be a little bit frustrating, but then with, with a lot of conscious effort, you can start kind of performing something correctly. Um, and then finally, with, with, with lots more practice down the line, that becomes um, unconscious competence, so you can do it w without much, um, much mental thought. So I've put up um, my, the, my, my annual jump numbers at like per year, okay? Um, so it, it, like I said, uh, I've got about 4,000 jumps. Um, so around about 2008 to 2010, that's when I joined the Red Devils. That's when, why my jump numbers kind of went um, up. Uh, then went down a little bit when I did like uh, other things within the military, not necessarily to do with parachuting. And then slowly kind of ascended um, a little bit around about 2013 to 2015, where I was kind of more involved with like mi military parachuting. So 2016, what I want to talk about is I, I, um, that that was a year where I was doing a lot of VFS and I was kind of taking part in big way. And how I, um, I, I would describe like being part of those big ways is I felt like I was operating about 60, 70 percent. So kind of like kind of in, in my comfort zone. Following that, like a, like a, a deployment and a bit of an injury, a couple of years low jump numbers when i was on the uk head up record in 2019 you know my jump numbers went up but nowhere near as much and i, I would describe b 
being part of that record, I was more operating at about 90%, so I was kind of um, uh, j having to work a lot harder with that. And I, I put that firmly down to lack of currency over, over, over a number of years. Uh, so then I've, I've got like, this is just an estimation. I, I, I think it's um, pretty accurate of ev every year, how many hours per year I've kind of like like spent practicing music. So I, as I kind of got older, and bit more involved in music, it kind of went up. Uh, when I was 17, 18, I went to the Royal Military School of Music. So that, that's where really, um, I, I think as conservatives, I was doing a thousand hours a year, pro probably more. Um, but d d talking about mastery with, with 10,000 hours, um, that would have taken another eight years at, at that kind of level to kind of to reach that mastery level. What what actually happened is sort of like changed careers, uh, and then a couple of years later, I kind of like picked up casually um, the guitar. Um, so in 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 those years, um, where I was just like but playing a little bit of guitar, I certainly wasn't at the level where I'd be considered to be um, even in a band. So I decided to change that and kind of put a lot more practice time, uh, and that I, I kind of went from like being able to kind of roughly play about five songs okay-ish to having to play about like 40 songs kind of on demand. And then uh, this last year when I've been part of winging it, then my practice time kind of went up. But w like s sometimes when people don't see the sort of background of what goes into um, a, a, a lot of kind of skills, it's it's like, it's like all of a sudden you could do something, but it's kind of what sort of went on in the background before um, kind of being able to perform at a level. Um, so that's about... A total of 6,000 hours, but only about 2,000 hours playing guitar. Um, so the key takeaways from this section. Um, so practicing more frequently, it, it ingrains and, and, and maintains skills. Okay, and, and a greater volume of practice, um, it can improve a skill. And, and I've stressed can because you need to sort of like build up a tolerance of those uh, larger volumes of practice. Um, now, if, if it's something like playing guitar, the, the worst that will happen is you'll kind of like get a little bit bored with it. If it's um, like a more physical kind of sport, then if you do too much too soon, you can risk injury. I think in, in terms of like skydiving, if you maybe like an A-license jumper that's suddenly doing like 12 jumps a day back to back, what you're then risking or, or kind of like doing too much tunnel time in one day, what you're risking is kind of um, a bit, bit of fatigue and then your, your reactions kind of slow down, so it's important to build up that that, that tolerance kind of kind of gradually. Um, so it's really got to, to get to ten thousand hours. It, it really does have to be something you won't get sick of. So in my my example of kind of doing music professionally and kind of working at that workload, it, it wasn't something I, I particularly wanted to do. So a lot of it is just kind of like like staying in in the game for a um, decent length of time. Um, so creating an environment where where practice is possible. Um, it, it, that, that, that will certainly um, make practice more accessible. Um, and, th and the best way really to guarantee performance just at the end, at the end of this section is to be well practiced in something. So when you're under kind of stress or pressure, um, to be able to, to fall back on all that kind of practice that you've put in um, beforehand. Now, what I will say is it's possible to practice something incorrectly. So it is totally possible to spend 10,000 hours practicing something and but, but practicing it in an incorrect way. And then, yeah, you have got really good at doing something in an incorrect way. So th this section, I'm going to talk about the flow state. Now, I promise I haven't just kind of mashed onto the keyboard. This is exactly how you spell this guy's name. Uh, and the way you, um, it's pronounced is Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. Uh, he's an American Hungarian psychologist. Um, and he talked about the flow state. Now, th this diagram might be familiar to some people. Um, <coughs> So the, f the flow channel is where uh, your skills directly match um, the challenges that, that you face. And, and people talk about um, d different descriptions of it, like losing track of time, um, becoming really engrossed in, in, into, the, into that. It's when, when the skills match uh, the challenges. So outside of that flow state, um, if you've got really high skills and the challenge is really low, you can experience boredom. Um, on the other side, if you've got really high challenges and don't really have the skills to match them, um, you can experience kind of anxiety. So expanding more on purposeful practice, which I mentioned in the last section. So you're progressively moving from an, ach an achievable level um, towards something that's currently unachievable. You're striving for what is just out of reach. And, and one way to think about it is making what was once your best a new average. Um, 
So an, an example I like to give is how, how kind of like sprinters train. They concentrate on maintaining an average throughout a season. And then when all the conditions are kind of met um, and ev everything's kind of gone right, then, then a PB, the way to describe it, like a personal best will kind of pop out of that. So it's, it's focusing on, on that kind of average and then uh, impro improving an average kind of performance. Um, so surrounding yourself with people whose average is is, is what's currently your best performance. Um, so I've I've had um, a lot of experience of that, um, especially in the military. What, what a lot of kind of different organisations within the military I joined. But when I first joined it, like their sort of business as usual kind of way of operating. I, like initially, it was kind of had to be my best performance, um, especially uh, joining like a band of with wing in it where they have loads of experience of kind of playing live and I was I was certainly having to kind of uh, like like for them it was business as usual for myself it was much more um having to kind of like like work towards my best performance most recently uh working with with the flight 1 military um especially guys from like the PD factory team that like especially starting that stuff that their sort of business as usual was definitely like my my sort of having to bring my my best performance working into that um <coughs> So a coach should understand wh where you currently are, okay, and when it's t time to progress and how, okay. So uh, not only is he drawing for however many hours, and it doesn't necessarily have to be ten thousand hours for for someone to be a good coach, but they uh, maybe drawing not necessarily drawing on their experience, but also they've guided other people through um, through that kind of same process, and and they have uh, the sort of uh, the, the the pathway identified. So generally, you're moving up in that flow channel. In opposition to that, we've got ambient practice. So this is where you're remaining in the boundaries of what's currently achievable, um, and you're kind of staying in your comfort zone. Um, the activity is, is, is automatic. So at, at best, what you're doing is you're maintaining your current ab uh, abilities. An example I like is most adult drivers have got 10,000 hours behind the wheel. However, there's a massive kind of variety in, in, in ability. Um, so it's, it's good for consolidation. So I'm not saying that ambient practice is, is necessarily bad in, in um, contrast to uh, purposeful practice, um, but it's, it's kind of like finding that balance. But sometimes you kind of need that um, uh, wh where you kind of d don't progress anymore until you've really consolidated and solidified um, a particular skill. So it, it, it's doing things that are, are achievable and enjoyable. So it's it's much more tempting to to do um, ambient practice, okay. Whereas working towards something that's out of reach is is not necessarily that. So kind of drawing on my sort of like musical history, I kind of spent a lot of time like playing the guitar. It's kind of just like a little hobby, um, and I, I was just doing enough to kind of enjoy, and I wasn't really pushing towards it. Once I kind of decided I wanted to be in a band, I, that's where I kind of focus on things that were necessarily like more mundane but critical to kind of improve my my skill um so generally i find w w when i'm kind of coaching or, or instructing uh it, for me that that's like ambient practice that's not really the environment where i'm like going to try something new or try and improve my skills i'm kind of using skills that are kind of that i can draw upon uh quickly uh, especially like if, if i am doing any sort of canopy piloting at the end of an aff jump or something that's maybe not the time to be going for my kind of best soup is more kind of doing what I, what I know that I can kind of do comfortably. So we're, we're remaining static in, in that flow channel. So how do we make progress? So we, we, we've got two kind of routes we can do. So we're, if we're at number one where we've got fairly low skills and we can face fairly low challenges and we want to be able to face higher challenges and improve our skills, we can either work towards um, or, or work on our skills in, in the direction of uh, what's position two uh, in this diagram. Um, initially, we may feel a little bit of boredom, but then at some point when we've worked on those skills, we'll be able to kind of face, um, face hi higher challenges. Or we can put ourselves in a sort of high challenge situation and hope that our skills will kind of catch up like quick enough. Okay, so it goes without saying that most times in skydiving, we really want to put ourselves, we, we want to work on our skills first rather than put ourselves in a kind of uh, anxiety situation. Um, it, it historically, like, the, the, the way that the, a lot of the military train is they, they kind of like set the, 
the the bar and and set the the sort of standard required and and you sort of like initially you keep sort of like failing with getting feedback until you sort of start kind of matching that that, that kind of performance level um what's a more modern kind of what way of training where you've you've constantly got like successes along the way so moving like one to two to four okay and and realistically this isn't just kind of like one movement it's like like very small steps going uh, and moving up in that flow channel so i've, I've got a little bit of a uh, some some short clips um so this is uh probably the, the most technical thing i play on the sort of winging it set um, and and kind of like how how I kind of um, practice that. So this is that at at sixty percent of what's the the sort of full speed. It's very short. I particularly chose videos that were like tidy in the background, so that was that was actually really difficult to find. Okay, and then moving up to eight percent. And then it falls. <laughs> so, any guesses on which one I posted on Instagram? <laughs> okay. So, ev everyone posts all their kind of best stuff. Okay. I did actually go back a few days later and I kind of posted a little montage going through the, the kind of steps. Um, so before I go into the kind of work that goes into like like uh, progression. Um, just kind of a little revision of the learning curve or, or the, the, the classic sort of um, the diagram of, of the learning curve. So it, it initially, when, when you're kind of working on a skill at the early stages, um, like, like progress is kind of really quick and noticeable. Um, but as, as you sort of advance more and more in a skill, um, it takes more effort from you to make smaller and smaller improvements. That's where we get that plateau. Um, so, so what that looked like in in, uh, in kind of ju just to kind of provide th those three little clips, uh, I actually started at kind of like 50% and moved in sort of like 10% increments. Um, so did a little bit of practice at 50%. The next day, I, I kind of moved to sort of 60%. Okay, it took about a day to go from 60% to 70%. It took a couple of days of practice, and then as we kind of went up more and more, it took more and more days of practice, um, and one kind of little technique is where you sort of like train to 110%, so faster than normal, so that when you go back to 100% speed, you can kind of, that, that feels comfortable. Um, so when, when I wasn't so serious about kind of practice, I, I use this technique a little bit, um, but I in all honesty, I'd get to 80%, I'd spend a little bit of time at 90% and think, well, that 90% is almost 100%, so I'll just like skip over, which kind of allowed me to, to be all right. Um, but I, as it shows, it takes a lot more work. Like the, the, the more you kind of advance it in something, it takes, uh, you actually need to spend more time to kind of um, progress even further. Um, so I've, I pulled up the uh, little graph of um, my, my canopy progression. So th this doesn't kind of show that, that sort of curve um, nearly as neatly um, because th there's a lot of factors. So but when I'm talking about practice, it's like kind of every day and there's no sort of breaks. Wh when it comes to, to skydiving, th there's a lot of other factors. Um, for instance, if I, if I look at the Katana 120, um, I got a lot of coaching on that canopy and I kind of had a really streak of good weather. So I did like um, maybe not so many jumps on that canopy, but in a short amount of time. Whereas Katana 107, I remember there was like kind of winter breaks and I didn't get as much coaching. So I particularly spent more time on that. W what's kind of starting to reflect that, that curve of the like requiring more work a bit more is when I'm looking at like the sort of cross brace canopies that I jumped where, um, you know, Velocity 96, Velocity 90, Valkyrie 84, I spent m more and more time. I've just started jumping a 79. I, I would expect that I'm probably going to spend more jumps on that canopy. Um, but yeah, so th there's, there's a few more factors that go into it unless you're kind of like guaranteed you're jumping every day. Um, so the key takeaways from this section is so we perform best in, in that flow state. And progressing to higher flow state, it's safer, especially in skydiving, by working on your skills rather than plunging into a high demand situation. If it is something like, like playing in the band, and the worst you can do is like kind of play a wrong note and kind of have, have a laugh about it. Um, so it's, it's certainly nowhere near as many risks um, as, as something like skydiving. Um, so I couldn't think of a better way of saying it, but so I kind of, this is a little bit of an overused phrase, but we don't rise to the occasion. We generally fall to the level of, of the training that we've, uh, we've done. Um, 
and what I will say is enjoy early stages of anything because progress is a lot quicker and, and more noticeable. Um, and the last little section I'm going to talk about um, a, a little concept called time paradox. So uh, that can be described as when, when skilled performers, they seem to have all the time in the world. And, and they have a recognition of familiar scenarios just, just through, through lots of practice and being in that environment a lot. Um, and they're able to chunk a lot of information, so their mental processes um, are a lot faster. Uh, and they, they have advanced information in the fact that they've been in that environment a lot um, and, and kind of be, been there and done that many times so, that, so they, can, they can kind of exploit that advanced information. Um, so this is the only kind of like little, little musical bit. It, it, it essentially, what, what, what makes good music and bad music is kind of like being in time. When you have like little groups of notes, especially when, you, when you're training kids, um, you use things like watermelon, or chicken soup or hot, hot fudge sundae. They're, they all seem to be around food, but essentially it's just kind of like uh, all the notes being placed and being timed really well. And it essentially what, when there's like, like most skills, whether it's skydiving or a lot of sports, it's all about you can substitute those notes for like movements in free fall, inputs under canopy, uh, and, and the difference between someone performing something well and making it look easy is that, that like those inputs are perfectly timed, whereas like a, um, someone more towards the amateur stage is, is like mistiming a lot of that and, and making something look like a lot harder work than it kind of needs to be. Um, so I, I kind of maybe made myself look like I'm like really disciplined the way I practice. Um, but I, I'll kind of like lay in on, on a secret is when I was kind of playing at those like sort of slower, more boring kind of stages trying to get everything right, I did have like maybe some sneak peeks at like the 100% because that's fun and that's kind of what I wanted to do. And when I sort of played that stuff back and, and seeing like what was going on, it wasn't so much that I was kind of, I couldn't play fast enough. What was generally happening is a lot of like what I was playing was like really compressed and, and I, was, I, I was actually like, like rushing. And I, so it wasn't so much I wasn't able to play fast enough. It was like I was lacking like control and timing. So I've got a little um, the, uh, a, a tunnel example, and I've I've picked something as low down in the progression as I could in the hope that um, as many people uh, here or, or watching this, it, it kind of can relate to it. So this is a back to belly transition, uh, and this is just um, my demo of it. So just um, there's a belly to back transition there as well, but. Okay, so I here we've got a student. Any anyone who's kind of experienced this, that you will know that there's like a there's sort of a progression in all, all the different little components of this transition, and you kind of like um, as well that the first few times you attempt it, um, you, you get some help from the, the sort of um, on duty uh, tunnel instructor to make sure you're not going to hit the walls. So this is one of my students. He's kind of gone through all of that. But this is like the first time he's uh, attempting that transition on, on his own. So potentially he's already kind of um, felt the wrath of the tunnel walls and and generally expecting a bit of anxiety. And he's just he just wants to kind of get it get it over and done with. Okay, so we're just going to watch the second attempt. I'm just going to pause it at the point where he thinks he's kind of belly flying. So that's just it. As you can see, there's quite a lot further on you need to kind of go before you even think about kind of belly flying. So if I sort of play my example with a pause. So the, the, the student isn't necessarily, um, it isn't necessarily kind of... Uh, and not doing anything fast enough. It's just he's, he's sort of like compressed all those movements because he's sort of feeling anxiety and, and wanting to kind of get everything over. So it's, it's more about spacing movements out and kind of exploiting advanced information. And, and that's sort of what I have to my advantage. I have a lot more kind of reps at that, um, at, at that kind of particular move. So in um, just kind of like in, in closing, so coaching, I, I, got, I see it as like a change in trajectory. So for instance, if your current practice uh, is kind of improving at a, a, a certain level, if you do get any sort of coaching, whether it's uh, like in the tunnel or canopy coaching or anything, so I initially when you start um, applying new ideas, advice, correction, uh, et cetera, um, it, it initially that, that um, change in trajectory might, might not even be noticeable, but it's kind of through uh, continue applying that, you, you, you're going to have like a, a sort of steeper learning curve where you can um, uh, apply the, those new concepts. 
Um, the way I think of it as well is if, if currently what you're doing, um, or, or um, maybe through through poor knowledge um, or, or, or wrong knowledge, you, you may be kind of on on route to an accident without even realizing it. Um, if at a point coaching takes place and you can sort of like correct uh, anything you do and then um, um, possibly uh, you, you could avert an accident, but obviously you can never sort of prove the negative. Um, so uh, what, what I see that the aims of myself as a coach um, is, is generally like I, I need to create an environment sufficiently regular so that it, it is predictable and you can start kind of seeing those regularities and once you can start identifying those regularities or I help you identify those regularities okay um, then through prolonged pr um, practice you can kind of start start no noticing uh, all the little nuances yourself um, and, and generally and especially that like the, the way we kind of like to coach in, in flight one is we want to give a student the tools, tools to coach themselves so they sort of understand themselves once they go away from our course, uh, or, in, or indeed, say, if, if I'm um, coaching either in the sky or the tunnel, uh, once they go away, uh, they understand exactly why something is happening, um, so th they can sort of like figure that out themselves once we've pointed it out to them. Um, however, the student's end of the bargain is it, it's not a passive process, so you, you kind of have to like like be active in that process as well. Um, and it, it's kind of down to you to sort of extract the, the necessary information, and, and of course the coach is there to kind of like like help you. Um, but especially when I'm kind of delivering uh, something to, to more more to like a group, like a canopy course, it, it's kind of like more down to the individual, I think, to kind of identify like the the, the key obstacles and like the the next thing that they need to work on I immediately to kind of to change. Um, and uh, any any um, misunderstanding, or you know, j just confirm as well anything that you're not sure of, um, of course. And then most importantly, I think is to identify the direction your practice should go after that kind of coaching session, so you can kind of uh, continue um, progressing. Um, so, so going back to 10,000 hours and, and how long it takes to kind of ma master a skill, I I, I do think. Sometimes, like the, the the word talent gets banded around like a bit of a, mi uh, a myth, so it's misleading sometimes to how much practice is, is required and how much like hard work people put in. That sometimes are a little bit modest about, um, and it, on one end it can lead to people not trying. On another end, if if some people are kind of like labelled talented, it can lead to to over progression, which uh, it, like we, we do see it from time to time in skydiving. It generally uh, it doesn't end in a great way. Um, so I, th I think a better definition of kind of talent could be the fact that, that those people are like really dedicated and they, they sort of persevere with, with mastering a skill. Um, they're really good at kind of goal setting. Um, they have a real desire to succeed and, and it's all that accumulation of purposeful practice um, that suddenly they're, they're kind of like noticed. So par parting thoughts, so every tunnel flyer, I guarantee, have started on their back and have spent head down on the net. Uh, it's maybe like early in the morning or late at night when you don't see it, okay? Every kind of swooper has started with straight in landings. Um, any instructor you see, they were once like a candidate on a course and, and even a, a student themselves. And I'm sure whatever you see on Instagram, there are multiple failed attempts that, that don't make Instagram, okay? So certainly not devaluing tal talent, but I think a lot, lot like the hard work that sort of goes into um, a, a lot of skills um, should be highlighted. So to briefly answer those uh, questions I get at the beginning, how long does it take to learn a swoop? Well, it might not take th that long to kind of make a canopy go fast. It's it's more about like how to kind of su survive that process and, and kind of uh, not not put yourself in into a a, um, a tricky situation. Um, so I, I'd I'd say more like a lifetime. Do I need to backfly before I can start sit flying? It's absolutely proven that um, kind of working on those earlier dare I say at basic stages, it's it's gonna help you with anything and more advanced and kind of get getting you a good foundation. The the, the very short answer for am I ready for whatever canopy, um aside from maybe what kind of um the, the British Scarlet and Charts say is um you should always make sure that your your brain is thinking faster than how your canopy is flying. And as long as you're that you're on that side of the equation, then you kind of um you can you can kind of keep up with what's happening, okay? How long until I can fly head down? It is a lot about like how how much you you kind of put into it. Um, 
why did you start that turn? So there, there's a suite of courses that we can kind of help you find that kind of answer. It's not like the be all and end all, but yeah, we can certainly help you find that out for, for, for yourselves in a, in a kind of safe way on the DZ. Uh, saw this post on Instagram, so, so don't forget all the kind of failed attempts that, that, that don't make um, Instagram and, and like maybe the, the hard work and practice has kind of gone into anything that, that you do see. So, um, cool, thank you very much for your attention, guys.